thank you all for being here. Those watching, thank you for taking time out of your Sunday to check us out. Please, as Pastor Isaac mentioned earlier, um, get a hold of us. Let us know how we can minister to you, how we can bless you, and let us know how this message has also blessed you. And if you are able to, please send it out as well by sharing it to to others um, out there in the interwebs. And uh, and who knows, maybe a few lives will be forever changed for all of eternity. And uh, Maybe you'll run into them in heaven, and they'll thank you for sharing that video. You never know. But with that, I'll go ahead and uh, share a few things here about our message. And I've titled today's message, Jesus is Better Than the Angels. Now, just as a way of reminder, last week when we covered that first part, the first three verses... Of chapter one, we looked at the sevenfold supremacy of the Son. Um, and there we saw that He is the inheritor. As creator, He is the heir of the universe. As redeemer, He bought our souls and made us His personal inheritance. He's also the creator, He created the universe's 100,000 million galaxies each with 100,000 million stars and 600 miles, each 600 miles across, and each fleeing away in never-ending expansion. How awesome is that? Christ, we also saw that Christ is the sustainer. He is sustaining the galloping galaxies as well as, as the sub-microscopic universe of atoms all by his spoken word. He's also the radiator. Like the sun, he is the source and radiator of divine glory. Not a reflection, but part of it. He is God. He's also the representer. He is the exact representation of the Father's being. He is everything God is yet separate. He is with God. We also saw in those three verses that he is the purifier. He is the cosmic sacrifice who paid for our sins with his blood in order to purify us, in order to cleanse us from all our sins. And in the seventh one that we saw was that he, was, he is the ruler he sits, having paid for our sins once and for all as the supreme priest. He is at the right hand of majesty in ineffable exaltation. And wonder of wonders, he prays for us. He's up there right now interceding for you and for me. Thus, these seven aspects of Jesus revealed how the Son, creator of the universe and heir of all things, has been exalted to an, except, to an exceptional position of authority and honor. Well, in the passages we'll be covering this week, uh, it's going to show us that this position of authority and honor makes Christ more superior to the angels. Now, that superiority was acquired as a result of his resurrection, ascension, and exaltation as Lord and Christ. Although it's true that prior to this, prior to that um, resurrection and, and ascension and exaltation, when Jesus was born, he was made for a little while lower than the angels, in order for what? In order to suffer and die. The writer of this letter will tell us of a prominent way in which God has now exalted him and enthroned him in the highest glory. 
And so if the topic of angels is something that interests you, our passage here is going to cover that, and also we'll be talking about it and discussing it here today, this morning. So before I read today's passage, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Lord, Heavenly Father, we are so thankful you've brought us all here, Lord. Um, we're thankful that you've brought us here safe and sound, Lord, and, and that you, we know that you have a reason for that, Lord, and, and we're excited to, to know what that is and to hear from you now because we know that your word brings life. And, Lord, you know that we need it. We need it so bad. Many of Maybe many of us are going through some really difficult situations at home, Lord, or at work. Maybe those, some of those watching are, are dealing with some health issues, some financial issues, some marital issues, Lord. But we know that regardless of what the, what the passage is for the day, Lord, even if it's regarding how your son is supreme and better than the angels, we know that there's a message in there for for us, Lord, that you have for us, each and every single one of us, and as a church. And so we, may we hear it now. So use me as your instrument, Lord. Use me as your vessel. Empty me of me and just fill me with your spirit, Lord, to speak your truth boldly and unashamedly. And open the hearts and minds of everyone that's here now and those who are watching and listening. Again, we're thankful for what you're about to do today. Pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Right, Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, and the Word of God says, So he became superior to the angels, just as the name he inherited is more excellent than theirs. For which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. Again, when he brings his firstborn into the world, he says, and let all God's angels worship him. And about the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his servants a fiery flame. But to the son, your throne, O God, O God, is forever and ever and the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. This is why God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy beyond your companions. And in the beginning, Lord, you established the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like clothing. You will roll them up like a cloak. And they will be changed like clothing, but you are the same, and your years will never end. Now, to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits, ministering spirits sent out to serve those who are going to inherit salvation? Now, let me ask you, what do you think of when you hear or see or hear just people talking about angels, the topic of angels? What comes to mind? You know, is there an image that are you, you know, does the image of a of little children with wings comes up or maybe, um, you know, some people I know have mentioned uh, just different descriptions of angels. You know, I recently, this past Christmas, I saw It's a Wonderful Life, and, you know, there, that an angel was that, little, was that little old man with the big, bushy eyebrows. I forgot his name, but, uh, but yeah, I guess he was waiting for that bell to ring so he can get his wings. But, you know, when I hear the word angels, I quickly turn around, but I think that's one of the reasons, well, one of the reasons my mom named me angel was it's after the archangel Michael, um, Miguel Angel is my name. Um, again, a lot of images may come up 
a lot of ideas may come up of what people perceive of what people perceive an angel to be. But the truth about angels may not be exactly what you think. For example, when Isaiah, one of our biblical characters here from uh, the Old Testament, saw the Lord high and exalted in the temple, he also saw hovering above him two seraphim, or that word seraphim means burning ones. According to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, these heavenly beings were equipped, insect-like, with three pairs of wings. Two fiery wings covered their faces, two wrapped over their feet, and two glowing pinions uh, beat the air as they called to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. Now, understandably, Isaiah was traumatized. Now, others had similar experiences with angels. For example, in Judges chapter 13, verse 20, when Manoah and his wife, in response to an angelic visit, offered a sacrifice. When the flame went up from the altar to the sky, the angel of the Lord went up in its flame. And so as you can see, angels can definitely be awesome. But what exactly are they? What does God's word tell us about angels? Well, angels are mentioned over 100 times in the Old Testament and more than 160 times in the New Testament. They exist in vast numbers. The Bible uses the word multitudes. On one occasion, they are described as assembling in a great throng or multitude again, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. 10, in most cases, they are invisible, as was the experience with Balaam, when the Lord had to open his eyes so he could see the angel blocking his way in Numbers chapter 22. Or consider... Elisha's servant who had his eyes open so he could see that he was protected by encircling chariots of fire in 2 Kings chapter 6. Ordinarily, when angels are visible, they have human-like appearances and are often mistaken for men. Sometimes they have shined with glorious light. Other times they have appeared as fabulous winged creatures, seraphim and cherubim. Now the Hebrew word for angel is malach, and the Greek is angelos. Both those words mean messenger, designating their essential function as divine message bearers. So as God's messengers... They can wield immense power. For example, staying or keeping away entire armies or delivering captors. Now, regarding angels' specific function, there are at least four. There are at least four functions. Angels continuous, continuously worship and praise the God they serve. And we could read examples of that in Job 38, Psalm 103, Isaiah chapter 6, and Revelation chapter 4 and 5. Number two, angels communicate God's message to men. They assisted in bringing the law. Angels revealed the future to Daniel and to the Apostle John. Matthew and Luke tell us that the angel Gabriel announced the births, the births of both John the Baptist and Jesus. Number three, angels minister to believers. It says in Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. 
for he will command his angels concerning you, regarding you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And that's from Psalm 91. See, angels have dramatically delivered believers from prison. Angels rejoice at the, conver- at the conversion of sinners. They are present within the church. So they're here among us. They watch the lives of believers with interest, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9, and 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. And we're told in Luke chapter 16, verse 22, that um, he carries believers, or these angels carry believers away at death. To their new heavenly home. Fourthly. Angels. Will be God's agents. In the final earthly judgments. At the second coming. They will call forth the elect. With a, bl- with a loud trumpet. From the four winds. And, and will then separate the wheat from the chaff. The book of Revelation tells us that they will open the seals, blow the trumpets, and pour the bowls of wrath. They will also execute the judgment against Satan and his servants. Now, what awesome beings they are. But despite all their cosmic excellencies, Their significant dwindles in the presence of Christ. And thus we come to the grand theme of Hebrews chapter 1 verses 4 through 14. Christ is better than the angels. So what does the writer, so why does the, why why does the writer expound it here? Why does he feel the need to write about it here? Right in the beginning of this letter. See, some of the Jewish believers to whom he was writing to were in danger of compromising Jesus' superiority and lapsing back into their religious Judaism. They were under pressure, first from the imminent threat of Nero's persecution for being Christians, and secondly, they were pressured because of being ostracized by their Jewish countrymen in the synagogue. See, they were being tempted to compromise. If they would simply agree that Jesus was an angel, perhaps even the greatest of angels, but not God, they would be accepted in the synagogue and escape the awful pressure. Such a prospect was tantalizing because it didn't require an outright denial of Christ, but only a different affirmation of him and his greatness as an angel. And the prospect was also face-saving because it didn't deny that they had a genuine experience with an exalted being. It only takes a little It only takes a little thought to identify with this temptation because the supremacy of Christ brings tension in everyday life. You see, we live in a culture where many claim to follow Christ. They they want to get along with everyone because they are Christians, because they follow Jesus. But the reality is one doesn't have to deny him outright to get along. Rather, we're encouraged to simply affirm that he was the very best of men to ever walk the face of this earth and that he is a supreme example of sacrifice from beginning to end and that his life was heroic. How many of you have heard that from people? He was just a great prophet, a great teacher, See, if one does this, the pressure will be off. 
What a temptation then for the Hebrew Christian in a life-threatening context. A simple change of emphasis on the person of Christ from son to angel and one would be spared all that suffering, all that torture, all that ostracism. But the writer of Hebrew is determined that his friends not fall to this. So he creates a mosaic of Old Testament text and that powerfully demonstrates the superiority of Christ over angels. Well, this section is compromised of seven quotations from the Old Testament, all of which prove the superiority of Christ to the angels. First of all, Christ is superior because he has a superior name. In verses four to five, four and five, it says, So he became superior to the angels, just as the name he inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father? According to Jewish thought, a person's name revealed his essential nature and could express rank and dignity. Jesus had the name Son from all eternity. And it's the name that will always be his as the perfect tense uh, of the phrase, the name he inherited indicates. No angel was ever called Son in the same way that Jesus was. The writer establishes this through two Old Testament quotes. The first is from Psalm uh, chapter 2, verse 7, which was fulfilled in Mark chapter 1, verse 11, at Jesus' baptism, when a voice came from heaven saying, You are my beloved Son. With you, I am well pleased. You see, Jesus was always God's Son. And God was his father. But the, but the phrase, today I become your father, evidently refers to Christ's exaltation and enthronement as son subsequent to his resurrection. Now Romans chapter 1 verse 4 says, Jesus was appointed to be the powerful son of God according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. And also in Acts chapter 13, Paul specifically proclaims that the resurrection fulfilled that psalm, Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. So you see, this is why Jesus, Jesus' Jesus's eternal name will always be Son and no angel at all no matter how great or how powerful or how small or tiny or how cute or ugly they look, will ever, uh, ever had that name, nor will they ever have it as well. That name, Son, capital S, only belongs to Jesus. And this is why his name is more superior than any other name. Now the author further grounds his argument with a second quotation taken from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. This was also a quotation from a well-known messianic passage commonly called the Davidic covenant. In that passage, the prophet Nathan told David that after his death, his son would build a house for God and establish a royal throne that would last forever. Well, if you know the story, if you read the story, we know that since that Solomon failed to fulfill this, as did the kings that followed Solomon. 
the later prophets were therefore looking forward to a greater son of David who would fulfill it. Well, that fulfillment of that ancient promise was celebrated in Luke chapter 1 when the angel Gabriel announced to Mary that her son would be that man. So we see that Jesus is superior to the angels because he was always God's son. And because two Old Testament sonship prophecies were marvelously fulfilled by him at his incarnation and resurrection and exaltation. His name is Son. While all that can be said of angels is what? Is that they're messengers. So it would be wrong. It would be just completely off if anyone would demote him to the position of an archangel, much less to a perfect man. Now, the next point in the author's argument for Christ's superiority over angels is that he is worshipped by angels. In verse 6, it says, again, when he brings his firstborn into the world, he says, and let all God's angels worship him. Here he turns to the final lines of Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 43, which the Jews also considered to be messianic. Now, its obvious application is to the angelic worship that had its first occurrence on earth at his birth when all of God's angels worshipped Christ. Thus, Jesus was undoubtedly worshipped by angels in eternity past. He was worshipped by angels during his 33 years he walked on earth. And he is worshipped in eternity present. A worship in which we've been given a glimpse of in Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. And there it says, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and also the living creatures and of the elders. Their number was countless, thousands plus thousands of thousands. They said with a loud voice, Worthy is a lamb who was slaughtered, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them say, Blessing and honor and glory and power to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Beautiful. What a beautiful image. You see, angels, unless they're fallen angels, don't worship other angels, for that would be angel allotry. The only one that can, and the only one that they can and do worship is God. Our job is to lift up Jesus. Next, the writer demonstrates the superiority to Christ, uh, the superiority, how, how Christ or Jesus is better than angels by contrasting their statuses. The angels are servants, but the Son is sovereign. Psalm 104, verse 4 is quoted regarding the angels being servants. In speaking of the angels, he says, and making the winds his messengers flames of fire his servants the emphasis of the writer here of in hebrews is that angels sometimes spectacularly inhibit in, inhabit wind and fire to do god's bidding as when the angel shot up 
through the flame on Manoah's sacrifice. But in doing this, still, there are only servants. On the other hand, verses 8 and 9 says that Christ, the Son, is eternally sovereign. Here, the writer quotes from Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. His throne, his scepter, his anointing, his anointing gives us the dimensions of his brilliant sovereignty. His throne, his rule will never end. His scepter, his authority will be executed in righteousness. A righteousness that he established in becoming the sacrifice for our sins. His anointing with the oil of joy refers to the heavenly joy that was his, that is his, as sovereign king of kings. It was, as Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 puts it, the joy that lay before him. And see, here's the point. Angels, his servants, may at his request take on wondrous forms. But they can become, they can become seraphim 30 feet high or men 300 feet high and perform extraordinary feats beyond our imagination. But as great as those feats are, as great as they, the things that will, they will do, and as astonishing as they are, they are still servants. Those angels are still servants. Jesus, on the other hand, is the eternally enthroned, sceptered, anointed sovereign. It's impossible to logically think of Christ and angels as peers. They're not. Any more than we can think of a sovereign and his slaves as equals. The fourth proof of Christ's superiority. For the fourth proof of, of Christ's superiority, the writer quotes Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27 which contain a broken man's rising awareness and celebration of God's transcending existence. Psalm 102 reads, as it is recorded here in verses 10 to 12 in our text, In the beginning, Lord, you established the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like clothing, but you will roll them up like a cloak and they will be changed like clothing. But you are the same and your years will never end. See, folks. See, church, the angels did not create the earth. There's, again, the, this misconception that there's some who were think that the angels were part of the creation process. But here's the thing. They too were part of creation. They were part of creation. They were involved in creation. They were part of creation. Jesus Christ is the creator. And one day he will do away with the old creation and bring in a new creation. Everything around us changing, changes, but he will never change. Says later, the, the writer in Hebrews, and uh, writer of Hebrew writes in chapter 13, verse 8, that he is the same yesterday and today and forever. So think of creation as an old garment, an old piece of clothing which will one day be discarded, which will one day be thrown away and replaced the brand new glorious one. Well, the Bible does tell us that, you know, again, we, you know, us humans are made differently than the angels, but one day when we have our glorified bodies and, 
and in heaven, in the kingdom of God, when we come face to face with the Lord, that we're going to have a different glory than that of the glory of angels with our new bodies. Now, the clinching argument for Christ's superiority over angels is his superior vocation. Christ rules, angels serve. That, that Christ rules supreme is proven by a passage quoted more often in the New Testament than any other. It's actually quoted 14 times. Jesus even quoted it himself and applied it to himself at his trial in Mark chapter 12, verse 36. It's Psalm 110, verse 1 which is quoted here in verse 13. Now to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool? The answer is, of course, a resounding none. Not one. No one. Christ's absolute rulership is dramatically seen here in that it was the custom for a defeated king to prostrate himself and kiss the conqueror's feet and for the victor to, pull, to put his feet on the captor's neck so that the captive became his, his footstool. See, church, one day every knee will bow before Christ. And every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And all the angels will be in that number, both good and evil. For the Son is infinitely their superior. In contrast to Christ's superior a ruling vocation, the angels' vocation is that of serving are not all angels, the author writes, ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? This doesn't mean their serving is a disgraceful vocation far from it. It's a sublime privilege. The point here is, however, is that, that it is inferior to the son's vocation that of ruling the universe. And so the beleaguered, that beleaguered Jewish believer who was being tempted to say that Christ is an angel and thus in order to escape persecution, here God's word issues a clear call. Christ is superior to the angels because he has a superior name he is son. A superior honor. All the angels worship him. A superior vocation. He is sovereign king. A superior existence. He is eternal and unchangeable. A superior status. He rules the universe. But there's something more here for all believers. All of us sitting here, every Christian around the world. It's a double encouragement. First, this supreme son is your God. Later, the author of Hebrews would say to them, to us, in uh, Hebrews chapter 14, verses 14 and 16, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that me, we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. See, 
Christ's cosmic superiority, prophetic superiority, priestly superiority, and angelic superiority are all at the believers' service in the world that many of you know is falling apart. Second, in respect to Christ's angelic superiority, all angels had been sent by him as ministering spirits to, to serve those who will inherit salvation. The force of the original Greek is that they are perpetually being sent out to help God's people, Christians, one after another. Now, as many of you probably already know, angels seem to be everywhere these days. We see them in movies, we see them in TV shows, we all kinds of different stuff, articles, books, websites about angels. There are entire stores devoted to angels. And yet, here's the thing. Angels, as I mentioned, are nothing more than servants. Whose servants? Ours. Our servants. For we are the heirs of salvation. In Psalm 91, verse 11, we read of their protective work. In Luke chapter 15, we see them rejoicing over saved sinners. In Luke chapter 16, the, uh, after, well, the chapter afterwards, we see them carrying people to their eternal state. In Acts chapter 5 and 12, we see them delivering Peter and the other apostles from prison. So you see, angels do indeed have a ministry, but that ministry is to us. They're not to be exalted or worshipped by us. We only have one intercessor. We only have one mediator, and that's Christ. There's, again, there's this idea that angels are speaking to God on behalf of you. No, Christ does that. And he only does that with believers. Be wary of any church, any Christian, any group that says they're going to worship angels, that are worshiping angels. If you hear about them, remind them of what they truly are. Again, yeah, they're, they're majestic and they're great, and we see several examples of that in the Old and New Testaments, uh, New Testaments of things they, amazing things they can do. But remind them, again, those who are holding angels at a higher esteem or at a higher level than Christ himself, that they are just servants. They are here to minister to us, to believers. That's why in Colossians chapter 2, there's a warning concerning the worship of angels. Our focus is to be on Jesus and on him alone. There's religions out there, denominations out there, there's that will, you know, put their focus on other things, other people, other saints in addition to Jesus. But the Bible is clear, God is clear that Christ alone God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit ought to be our object of worship. He alone is our God. He alone is what we ought to aim for, strive for, who we ought to please and obey, who we ought to feel convicted when we disobey. Yes, we can admire 
the saints of old. I admire the bravery of all the women we read about in the New Testament, how they ministered to Jesus in those dangerous times. I admire the, the heart and bravery of Jesus' mother having to bear him in the condition that she had to bear him and, and also to witness his crucifixion. But to worship any other man, woman, is idolatry. And we shouldn't. It's a sin. Idolatry is a sin. It's one of the, we're breaking one of the commandments. So whether it's, again, a saint, and a saint of old, or, or whether it's an angel, avoid the temptation to, to worship them, to try to you know, make them equal to Christ. Christ alone died for your sins. Christ alone suffered the penalty. Nobody else. Nobody else was there suffering with him. He took those nails in his hands. He took that nail in his foot. He wore that, the crown of thorns. He was beaten. His beard was pulled out. And he was thrust with a spear in his side. And he hung on that cross all by himself. Nobody else. And so that's what makes him savior. That's what makes him king. That's what makes him superior to the angels and to anybody else. Our focus is to be on him. Our superior Christ has assigned his angels to minister to you. And if he wills, he can deliver you anytime and anywhere he wishes. You see, Christ is superior to everything. He is adequate in your hour of need. You must believe it and trust him with all you are and all you have. And so I'll end what this question is, who do you worship? Who is your focus on? Who do you think, who do you say Christ is? Is your focus on him? Is he your life? Is he the focus of, is, who, is that who you want to grow up to be? As the saying goes, we can have our, or the people we look up to here on earth. And, but every single born-again believer, I believe, ought to have that desire to want to be more like Christ. To be less of themselves, to be less, to, to, to make themselves less and to make Christ more, to bring more of Christ who is in them, to bring them out more so that others can see him in you and glorify God. Not to say that, oh, you're such a great guy and you have a great heart and man, you're such a, you know, you, you're good with charity and, and you're such a great person. No, it's to glorify Christ. Again, he will always be there for you. In the end, he will always be there for you. And so if you're watching this message and listening and you realize your need for Christ, you're, you see, you understand, hey, you know what? I've had this misconception about angels and I thought they were one thing, but they're, now I see that in reality there's something else and they're here to serve me and well they can and they will 
but you must be willing to come to Christ. You must be willing to, freely willing to lay your sins upon the cross and allow Christ to be the Lord, your Lord and Savior. And he ministers to believers. That's who they watch out for. So, if you want to be a born again believer, I, in a minute, I will lead you in a prayer to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. But here's the thing the reality is that you must come to terms with the fact that you're a sinner. You must be willing to admit that wholeheartedly that you're guilty of sin, no matter how much or how hard you try to make up for those sins or all the works that you're doing, it's never going to be good enough. But Christ has given us a perfect way to have those sins forgiven, and that's by believing in him confessing him as your Lord and Savior. So, if you're ready to do that, you're ready to be born again, wherever you're at, you should close your eyes and bow your head. Those who are here, those who are believers who are watching, you can also bow your head and close your eyes and pray for those who will be praying, who are praying this, who will be praying this, and that heart, that God would move powerfully now in their lives. So if you're ready to be born again, pray this with all your heart. Lord Jesus, I admit and confess that I'm a sinner. And now... I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I truly believe that you died on the cross for my sins, all my past, present, and future sins. And then three days later rose from the grave. And so... I now repent of all those sins. I turn back from them. And I now confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. And I ask you to fill me to the brim with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and teach me now that I am born again. In your name I pray this. Amen. For those of you who prayed that message, please reach out to us. We want to hear your story. We want to hear that you we want to know that you prayed uh, that prayer to receive Jesus. If you need, um, if you need a Bible, please let us know. We'll send one out to you, even if it's on the other side of the the world. We'll try to get it to you as quickly as possible. Um, but also, let us know anything that you need prayer about. Um, even if it's in a different language, I can find the Google Translator, and you know we'll, we'll pray for that. But, you know, reach out to us. Let us know how we can continue to minister, maybe help you find a church in your area where you'll be taught the Word of God. Um, and if you're here locally, again, we welcome you to, we want to welcome you or we want to invite you here to Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. And we're located here on Hondo Pass and Gateway South. Um, again, there's angels rejoicing for those of you who are praying. Those angels are rejoicing. They are partying up in heaven right now because a sinner has, uh, a sinner has now come to life and they're born again and you know they're no longer going to hell. So um, you can rejoice with them. 
and we will be rejoicing with you as well. Thank you for watching this week. Um, again, please join us next week. Lord willing, we'll be here as we continue now in Hebrews chapter 2. Um, thank you again for spending some time out of your Sunday or out of your night, evening, whenever you're watching this. Um, we appreciate you and, um, and thank you. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.